Hey everyone, it's Oney here. Uh, maybe a more formal greeting. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, and I say all three because I'm not 100% sure at what time you are listening or watching and listening to this. Welcome to our Good Friday service. Now, I long for the day where we would be able to gather together and it just feel normal. I would have preferred for us to gather on this Friday uh, and to celebrate all that Jesus has accomplished on our behalf now because of COVID and the various restrictions and the building that we are currently in now, we just couldn't make it happen. We felt it wise to rather do our Good Friday service this way, digitally, uh, and then gather together on Sunday to celebrate both digitally and in person. And so I long for that day uh, where we will be able to gather physically, where it feels normal, everyone feels safe, uh, and that we can just celebrate together all that God has done. But I do recognize God's grace on the fact that we live in a time such as this, uh, where technology allows us uh, to continue to communicate the beautiful truth of the scriptures that speak of our Savior who reconciles us to our Father. If this is the first time you're tuning into a Rooted service, welcome on behalf of the Rooted Fellowship family. Uh, I want to welcome you. I'm thankful that you've decided to plug in this particular day, uh, and we hope that you get to experience all of God's goodness. To the regulars, uh, hey guys, it's really, really good uh, to, to connect this way and um, your messages and your prayers have been so encouraging to me. Uh, I know many of you have reached out to me and just said, hey, it's good to have you back. It's good to have the Makatlis back. And so thank you so very, very much. Now, Good Friday, also referred to as Holy Friday, but many of us know it as Good Friday. Friday, and if you know a little bit of what this day is about, it would leave you wondering what's so good about it. Uh, this is the death of the Son of God, our Lord and Savior. What is so good about it? But if we are to take the scriptures in totality, if we're to look at the greatest story ever told that is found in the Bible, that we would see that this day is said to be good because it speaks of a good savior who did a good act on behalf of us. And we are not that good. In fact, apart from Jesus, there is no goodness in us. We are not the standard of goodness. And yet the one who is perfect laid his life down so that for those who submit and trust in him would be considered holy in the sight of God. This is why we celebrate. We celebrate the death of Jesus. Now, I want to take a couple steps back. See, normally on a Good Friday, uh, we would preach a message on the death of Jesus. But I want us to take a few steps back to look at, at a time where Jesus is with his disciples and he's sharing a meal with them that, because there is great significance in that meal. And so let me set the scene. You've been invited to a covenant meal, a table set in the midst of hostile enemies. Bread and wine are the food and drink of choice. The host is a righteous king who lives in the holy city, Jerusalem, and serves the God most high as his faithful priest. When you look at your invitation, the RSVP calls you to renounce your idols, to repent, which means to turn away from whatever it is that you are running to, to find life and meaning in. And so to turn from that, to repent and believe and acknowledge the greatness of your host by receiving the greatest gift ever given. This table offered freely to you is set for those who believe God's promises and refuse to partner with the kings of this world. This table is for those who have been justified by faith in the promises of God most high. That's the invitation. You're invited to this meal. Now, the question is, 
What is this invitation describing? If you said the Lord's Supper or communion, you'd be correct. And if you said Abram's meal with Melchizedek, you'd also be correct. Now, many of us would be aware of the one meal with Jesus and his disciples, but the second meal might be landing on fresh ears. This should leave us asking two questions. Firstly, who is Abram and Melchizedek? And then secondly, how can one description point to two events? You see, the answer is that God ordained the Old Testament events of Genesis 14 to prepare the way for Jesus Christ and the covenant he sealed with his blood and celebrated on the night before his death. Now, I want you to get comfortable because uh, we're going to sit back and unpack a number of scriptures. And so grab your notebook, grab your Bible, get a pen, because we're going to walk through a number of scriptures looking back so that we might look forward. And so let's start with this meal. To be exact, the covenant meal. See, throughout the Old Testament, covenants, and a covenant is simply a promise between two or more parties who are called to perform certain actions. A a covenant is a promise made. And so covenants were celebrated and consecrated with meals. At Sinai, we see Moses, Aaron, and his sons and 70 elders eat and drink on the mountain of God as God makes a covenant with them. Likewise, in Genesis, when Jacob and Laban make a covenant, they too ate a meal together, and so on and so forth throughout the scriptures. Picking up this pattern, Jesus initiated his covenant meal when he broke bread and drank wine with the disciples on the night before his crucifixion. Mark chapter 14, verse 22 to 26 says this, As they were eating... This is Jesus and his disciples. He took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them and said, take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in the new in the kingdom of God. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, while Jesus is doing something new, eating a meal which would remember his death and resurrection, he's basing his new covenant meal on Israel's Passover and the pattern established throughout the Bible. Covenants include meals with bread and wine the first of which we find in Genesis 14 between Melchizedek and Abram, who would later become Abraham. So let's look at this account. Genesis 14 records the hostility of the kings of Canaan. Verses 1 to 12 describe the battle of nine kings. But it is the tenth king who is greater than all of them. And we'll see that in a moment. In verses 13 to 16, we learn Abraham, God's chosen friend, has defeated five kings with his 318 trained men and saves his nephew, Lot. We see him going on a rescue mission. I want you to think about that for a moment. What did Jesus do? Did he not come on a rescue mission? Let's go back to Genesis 14. I'm getting ahead of myself. And now on his victorious return, this is Abraham after rescuing his nephew Lot, on his victorious return from the battle, he encounters Melchizedek, who we are told is the king of Salem, who did not partake in the Canaanite warfare, but did serve as a priest to God. Genesis 14 verses 20 records Abram giving this king a tenth of his spoils from the battle because he recognized the greatness of this priest king. 
Hebrews 7 tells us this. Significantly, the chapter portrays Abram as greater than all the other kings, and yet Melchizedek greater than him. Importantly, though, Melchizedek's greatness is seen not in his warfare or his army. Genesis doesn't even mention his family or his kingdom. Instead, his greatness is seen in his generosity and his blessing. Again, I I want us to not forget that, hey, Jesus is still in the picture here. How is this connected to our Lord and Savior? See, here's where I want us to sit for a while and unpack. Here in Genesis 14, let's go to Genesis 14, verse 18, which says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and the priest of God Most High, brought Abram some bread and wine. So though Abram probably had no idea of the significance of this bread and wine and what it would mean, first in the Passover, and then in the Lord's Supper, there was something about this mysterious priest king. Melchizedek is his name. There was something mysterious about him that compelled Abram to partake of the elements offered and receive the blessing given. Most of us would have heard of Abraham, who would later become Abraham. We, we, we would know of him. If you're familiar with the scriptures, you would know of Abram. I mean, aside from Moses, no Old Testament character is mentioned more in the New Testament than Abraham. James refers to Abraham as God's friend, James chapter 2, verse 23, a title used of no one else in the scriptures. Believers in all generations are called the children of Abraham. Abraham's importance and impact in redemptive history can clearly be seen in the scripture. So we we know of Abraham, but who is Melchizedek? Who is this mysterious figure and what, what is so important about him that God included this short story about him in the scriptures for us? And how is his encounter with Abraham connected to the Lord's Supper? Let's unpack this. Uh, Let me start by talking about Melchizedek's name. The name Melchizedek is a a compound of two Hebrew words. Melek is the Hebrew word for king, and Zadok means righteousness. And so Melchizedek was literally the king of righteousness. What is Jesus often referred to as? Don't forget that. Let's make these connections. We're also told that Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Uh, Now, many theologians believe that Salem is one of the ancient names of Jerusalem. Psalm 76 verse 2 refers to Salem in a way that implies that it is synonymous with Jerusalem with the reference in Genesis 14 verse 17 where it says uh, the king's valley. This further confirms this connection if we look at them together. Here's another interesting truth. Uh, Nothing is said about Melchizedek's parentals, his ancestry, his descendants, his birth or death. He reigns as priest and king with no beginning and no end. Hebrews 7 verse 3 tells us this. Melchizedek is not mentioned again in the rest of Genesis, and his name comes up once in the Psalms, Psalm 110, and we'll come back to the Psalm in a moment, and then nowhere else in the Old Testament. The writer to Hebrews talks about him in Hebrews chapter 7. That's where his name comes up again. See, the kingship of Israel could only trace their roots back to David. If we looked at the scriptures, the kingship of Israel can trace its roots back to David. The priesthood, so that's the kingship, but the priesthood of Israel could only trace their roots back to Aaron and the tribe of Levi. And yet we clearly see here that Melchizedek preceded both. He came before both of them. 
He was both the king and priest of Jerusalem, the city of God, long before the giving of the monarchy or the priesthood. And Abraham, our forefather, knelt before him. So now that we have somewhat of an understanding of who Melchizedek was, and if we put on our kingdom glasses, we can start to make some clear connections to Jesus. Let's go back to the offering of bread and wine. Genesis 14, verse 18. It says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and priest of God Most High, brought Abram some bread and wine. See, in historical context, bread and wine were often associated with covenant meals. And the mention of his priesthood suggests that this meal was more than just a charitable service, more than just a helping hand to feed a hungry and thirsty man. Remember, Abram had the plunder and the spoils of war. He didn't need food. To be quite honest, he didn't need anything. Rather, what he lacked was righteousness. This is a man who had everything and yet lacked one important thing. He lacked righteousness, the very thing that Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, inherently possessed. Let's take a look at the priestly blessing that Abram gets from Melchizedek. Genesis 14 verses 19 to 20. It says, Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. He says, blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. You see, in this twofold blessing that Melchizedek gives to Abraham, we see the king of Salem, the king of righteousness, Melchizedek, standing between heaven and earth, blessing the man Abram and praising God most high. He, he's in the position of a righteous mediator. Again, Friends, you have to have your kingdom glasses on as we look at this text. Melchizedek standing between heaven and earth and blessing the man Abraham, our forefather, in the position of a righteous mediator. The position Aaron and his sons would later assume in Israel. Melchizedek communicates the blessings of God to the man who would in the very next chapter receive the gift of righteousness by faith in God's promises. By no means is Genesis 14 a deviation from the storyline of Abraham and redemptive history. It matters. It's important for us to take note of. It plays a key part in seeing Abraham as a mediator of blessing to the nations, as was promised by God. In fact, as the rest of the story unfolds, we see Abraham is declared righteous when he believes God's promises. Then later, as God's covenant with Abraham unfolds, we see his heirs will be kings. Genesis 17 verse 6 tells us. And his firstborn son, Isaac, will be redeemed by the Lord's provision at Mount Moriah, which is located where? In Salem, where Melchizedek is king. It's the very home of Melchizedek. See, in other words, after meeting Melchizedek, dining at his table, and receiving his blessing, Abraham and his heirs become a nation of royal priests who inhabit Melchizedek's Salem and proclaim a message of peace that invites all the families of the earth to come and eat where at Melchizedek's table. In other words, in the storyline of redemption, Melchizedek plays a key role in communicating blessing to Abraham and the greater king of righteousness 
that would come from his line. Let's talk about another old great Testament hero, David. Again, another individual that many of us would be familiar with. David, otherwise also known as King David. No last name, just King David. David, a descendant of Abraham and the first true king of Israel, is given a vision of his son, the Lord, in Psalm 110. This is again where Melchizedek is mentioned. In the psalm, David describes this greater son. He's referring to Jesus. He's he's kind of looking into the future. He's not just talking about his son Solomon, but he's looking into the future, describing this greater son as a royal priest like who? Like Melchizedek. Psalm 110 verse 4, it says, The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. You are a priest forever, according to the pattern of Melchizedek. It's important that we don't isolate passages from the scriptures as individual pieces. We must not do that, but rather see them as puzzle pieces being put together to tell one incredible story. Friends, my fear is that if we fail to do so, If we fail to look at the scriptures as one beautiful story, we run the risk of seeing God's, uh, we run the risk of failing to see God's fingerprints of grace scattered throughout the generations. That from Genesis 3, God has been on a rescue mission for his people, and that Jesus has always been option one. That everything, everything points. To him, Jesus says this in John chapter 5, verses 35 to 40, that everything is pointing to him, that when we come to the scriptures, we must ask the question, what is this saying about Jesus? Because in Jesus, we see the Father. So just as Melchizedek gave bread and wine to Abram, with the wicked king of Sodom watching in close proximity. You must read the text. He's watching in close proximity. In the same way that that happened, David saw a greater son of David who would come and prepare a table in the presence of his enemies. Psalm 23. Indeed, by handing himself over to his enemies, Jesus made a sacrifice that would not just provide blessing for the sage only, rather, as Psalm 118, verse 22 to 26 prophesies, the stone that the builders rejected would become the cornerstone, and this cornerstone would form the foundation of God's new kingdom. Just as Melchizedek refreshed Abram with bread and wine, So Christ would offer his body to turn back the curse of sin and death and provide a final sacrifice from which the nations would come and drink. And so just like Abraham didn't need anything physically, he needed something spiritually. He needed to be refreshed spiritually. Friends, we are no different. We are no different. As the book of Hebrews puts this all together, Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, Christ's righteousness is not based on the weakness of the law. It is based on his perfect sonship, his intrinsic righteousness, his obedience until death, and his resurrected and glorious life. In all these ways, Jesus is a priest of God Most High and a true king of righteousness, offering to us heavenly bread and wine for salvation. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16 says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Jesus is the ultimate great high priest. He is the king of righteousness. And so when we partake of communion, when we come to the Lord's table, we remember Jesus' body broken and blood shed for us. We must celebrate. We must celebrate that this was fulfilled on the cross. But we must also recognize that this was promised to us long ago, that this goes all the way back to Genesis 14. That God has always been on a rescue mission. See, the meal of Melchizedek is the bread and the wine, but it is so much more. We go beyond the appearances of bread and wine to the reality of the Son of God and His body and blood, soul and divinity. By that one sacrifice, we have confidence. By that one sacrifice, we have forgiveness. By that one sacrifice, we receive power to obey our Father God. What started in Genesis with a meal between Abram and Melchizedek was fulfilled at the Lord's Supper through Jesus Christ. So that all who trust and believe in the risen King might sit and feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9. Hear these words. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give Him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And so a meal between Melchizedek and Abraham points to this incredible meal that happened on the night before Jesus was crucified. What we now come to know is the Lord's Supper communion. So that those who put their faith in Jesus, who come to that table, will receive the promise that one day you will sit at the ultimate table. The ultimate table. The marriage supper of the Lamb. The fulfillment of what God promises His people in Jesus for those who surrender their lives to Him. And so, communion, something that we would take after a Good Friday service, is more than just bread and wine. I mean, these are simple elements, elements that many of us would have in our homes, accessible to many of us at any local store. They're more than just that. As we look in Genesis 14, we see a promise being made. We see a trailer attraction to what Jesus would fulfill. And Mark, as we've just read, we see Jesus with his disciples saying that what you have been waiting for has now been fulfilled in me. Take hold of this so that one day you would be at the ultimate table where we celebrate with all of God's people because of what Jesus has done in reconciling us to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so having said that, I think it would be timely and necessary for us to partake of communion. And so wherever you are, 
grab some bread, grab some wine or some grape juice. And let us partake together as we are reminded that God has always been on a rescue mission. That he's always had us in mind. That he always had a plan for us to be reconciled back to him. And that plan was Jesus. And so friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, this is now after the resurrection, Luke chapter 24, verses 30 to 31, we're told our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples. He took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. It's for those who come, whose eyes have been opened, who now recognize who Jesus is. The King of righteousness who comes to bring peace. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, Lord, and praise our eternal God, our Creator. You have given us life and second birth in your spirit. Once we were no people, but now we are your people. You claimed Israel as your chosen nation and raised up the church as a witness to the resurrection, breathing into it your life and power. From worlds apart, you gathered us together. We go astray, and yet you continue to welcome us home. Always your love has been steadfast. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of heaven and with all the faithful of every time and of every place who forever sing to the glory of your name, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God, of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Lord, remembering your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us. And we celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accepting this sacrifice, we praise you and give you thanks. As a living and holy offering of ourselves. That our lives would be fully surrendered to you. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine that we break the bread and the cup that we bless. May this communion, this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ be that very thing that unites us to you and reconciles us to the Father. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in this world. And this blood is the blood of the new covenant that seals us and guarantees for us an inheritance that awaits us. And so as we take these simple elements, the bread and the wine, we remember what Jesus did with his disciples. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take 
eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. And so for those who are in Christ, for those who've already surrendered their lives to Jesus as Lord and Savior, we do this in remembrance of the greatest gift ever given. I have no idea where you are in this moment whether you have strayed away from God, whether you have found yourself going to all these other things, hoping to give you what only Jesus can give you. This is an opportunity for you to come home, to turn away from the father of lies and to come home, to be reminded that all that we search for can only be found in Jesus. That there is nothing that will separate us from the love of God. That for those who are in Christ, there is now no condemnation. That in Christ is every spiritual blessing. That you have been chosen. That you have been redeemed. That you have been adopted into the family of God. That you have an inheritance. That you are loved. But maybe, maybe you've been sitting on the fence for a while. Maybe you're hearing this message and something is stirring in your heart and you know that you have not surrendered your life to Jesus. Then I want you to know that right now in this very moment, the most important moment of your life, right now is an opportunity for you to surrender to God. To see the meal between Abraham and Melchizedek as a promise made for all of humanity, fulfilled in Jesus as he celebrates this table with his disciples. That if you give your life to him, that you will one day see yourself at the great banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is a promise that Jesus delivers on every single time. It's an opportunity for you to let go of all these things that failed you time and time again. To let go so that you might take a hold of Jesus. He loves you more than you could ever know. He died for you. But he is not in the tomb. He is seated right now at the right hand of the Father praying for you. It's an opportunity for you to take that step and put your trust in Jesus. For the first time to partake of his body and his blood so that you might be saved. Gracious God, may we who have received this sacrament, these simple elements that point to an eternal reality. May we live in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we may show forth your gifts to all the world, declaring that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, the King of righteousness, the one who comes to bring peace. We ask all of this in your precious name. Amen. Of 
Jesus What can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can wash away my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can wash away my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus So oh, precious Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fountain I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing but the blood of Jesus Walk and wash What can wash away my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fountain I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood of